Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us with your favorite podcast software. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast, in particular, The Amazing World of Radio at amazing.greatdetectives.net. We will be returning on May the 21st for an old-time radio program featuring the late Harry Belafonte. And we'll also be announcing our summer series, which will kick off on May the 31st. Check it all out at amazing.greatdetectives.net and find all of the podcasts we do over at greatdetectives.net. Well now, it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air dates, January 2nd and January 3rd, 1956. It's the Kalen Manor episodes 1 and 2. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Walt Albright, Johnny. Trinity Mutual Limited. Oh, hiya, Walt. How's your health? Terrible, since you ask. I got asthma, Johnny. Again? I thought we agreed that... Yeah, I know. I get suspicious. I get asthma. Happens every time. Cure me, will you? What's the case, Walt? Man named Eddie Kalin, C-A-Y-L-I-N, out in Los Angeles, died yesterday. $5,000 policy, double indemnity. What did he die of? Mysterious circumstances. Well, that's usually a fatal disease, all right, That's it, Johnny. That's all I know. Mysterious circumstances. The body was identified by the widow. I see. Our salesman out there can probably help you. He issued the policy only six weeks ago at the request of the widow. Uh Uh-huh. Six weeks, one premium paid, check signed by the widow. Hey, tell me something. Would the beneficiary happen to be... That's right, the widow. Oh, this asthma's killing me, Johnny. You gotta do something about it. All right, Walt. Just call me doctor. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Kalen matter. Item one, $198.20, airline fare and incidentals, Hartford to Los Angeles. I hadn't arranged for anybody to meet me when I arrived at L.A., so I picked up my bags and headed for the taxi stand. Mr. Dollar, please... Uh, wait a second. He was a small man, nervous and fluttery, with a shiny pink nose and a face like a little white rabbit. I was watching for you out on the ramp, but somehow you must have slipped by. And... You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? Yes, I'm Johnny Dollar, but I don't think I... Uh... Uh, Welch. Presley Welch. I'm the... Oh, yes, you're the district salesman here for Trinity Mutual. That's right. Well, how are you, Mr. Welch? <laughs> I'm out of breath at the moment <laughs> from running, you understand. You see, I'm troubled occasionally by asthma. You too. Oh, do you have asthma, Mr. Dollar? No, it's a friend of mine in Hartford. Oh, in Hartford? Oh, well, you don't say. Yes, in fact, I came out here just to cure it for him. Out here? Oh, this is the worst place you could have come? Oh, you see, the smog here is so... Ba- Oh, no, I do believe you're Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I am at that. Come on, let's add to my expense account with a cup of coffee. Oh, you really think we should? Oh, why not? Let's be daring. All right, let's. I always say if the company can't afford it, come on. If Presley Wells sold insurance the way he answered questions, it was amazing that he hadn't starved to death years ago. He skidded around the field, flip-flopped overhead, and buzzed the tower, all verbally, of course, and for 15 minutes, he didn't touch a wheel to the ground. But when he did finally land, he came in with a swoop. I do hope you'll accept my apologies, Mr. Dollar, for causing all this trouble, because the whole thing is my fault, of course. I don't see how. 
Unless you murdered Eddie Kalin. I mur- oh, 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 why, I, I scarcely knew him. <laughs> a perfect alibi. Oh, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. Well, I'm just joshing. What I meant was, I wrote the policy. And I knew better right when I did it. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Well, Mr. Kalin was quite facetious about the whole procedure. When I tried to point out the retirement security factors in our multiple endowment plan, he actually laughed. You don't say? Yes. He said all the security he'd ask for was two aces up and one for the kicker. <laughs> well, what about Mrs. Kalin? What was her attitude? Well, she was quite serious about it. Wasn't she the one who actually applied for the policy? Well, not technically. The beneficiary can't, you know. It's against the rules. Yeah, I know, but didn't well, she... Well, she was the one, yes, that called me and asked me to come out and talk to her husband... And he finally signed the application, but he seemed to regard it as a joke. He only did it as a favor to her, uh, something of that sort. And now it's turned out to be a $10,000 favor. What kind of a woman is she, Mr. Welch? Well, she's quiet, well-mannered, quite charming, I thought. I, I must confess I felt a good deal of sympathy for her. In view of her husband's incessant flippancies. A real happy fellow, huh? Oh, positively frivolous, Mr. Dollar. And I should have been warned by his attitude. You know, insurance is a serious business. Oh, sure. But Eddie Kalin didn't laugh himself to death. Oh, oh my. Oh, he died in the fire when his automobile company... <laughs> Oh, oh, laugh. Oh, I see what you mean. Say, tell me, how well did you get to know the Kalins, Mr. Wells? Oh, hardly at all. I saw Mr. Kalin twice, once at his apartment the evening I sold him the policy, and, and then two weeks later at my office when he came in to sign the paper. And Mrs. Kalin? Only once, that evening at their apartment. She phoned me earlier in the week. And you haven't seen her since her husband's death, huh? No, no. I phoned to express my sympathy, but... That she wasn't available. She hasn't filed a claim yet. No, but I knew she would, so I took it on myself to notify Hartford. I, I just can't help feeling guilty about this, you know. Yes, so you mentioned. Yeah, not that I really am, of course, but, uh, well, you understand. It's, uh... Oh, sure, I understand. Mm. Well, <clears throat> I'll keep in touch. Watch out for comedians, Mr. Welch. Watch out for who? Oh, oh, comedians, watch out. <laughs> Expense account item three, $6.35. Taxi fare to the Beverly Wilshire Hotel and a second taxi to the West Los Angeles Precinct Police Station. The case wasn't being handled by any of the usual departments, Bureau of Homicide, Missing Persons, and so on. The man in charge was Detective Sergeant Jose Reynosa, unattached, working out of the Central District on special assignment. Pull up a chair, Mr. Dollar. When I talked with him in his office, Reynosa told me the reason for it. Yeah, it's a funny deal, Mr. Dollar. The facts in the case could point a lot of different ways. But the way it stands right now, they just don't add up in any direction. At least not quite. Do you mind filling me in on some of those facts, Sergeant? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Last Thursday morning at 4.20 a.m., we got a call relayed through the fire department to investigate a burned automobile out on the Palos Verdes headland, uh -huh. up in the hills above the harbor. The car was lying in the bottom of a ravine below the road, and it was a total loss. Apparently, the gas tank had burst and flooded the whole interior. Oh, what do you mean, apparently? Well, the upholstery may have been deliberately soaked with gas. The arson squad isn't sure. I see. That's why this case doesn't quite fit in any niche, Mr. Dollar. It might be homicide, might be arson, missing person, or only an accident. We're not sure yet. Anyway, there was a body in the driver's seat, burned to a cinder. Unrecognizable. But we did recover a few personal effects. A signet ring, keychain, wristwatch with a strap burned off, a wallet badly scorched. Mm -hmm. I noticed the keychain has a metal tag with the address stamped on it. Yeah, that and a part of the driver's license were the only leads. Eddie Kalin, Argus Terrace Apartments up on Sunnyway Drive above the strip. So we went up there and we ran into a second surprise. What do you mean? Nobody home. We attained access, found the place in a mess. There'd apparently been a fight, a chair and a couple of lamps were broken, and there were bloodstains in the living room. What about Mrs. Keelan? Located her the next afternoon. She'd been spending a few days at a friend's cabin up at Arrowhead. Does the friend confirm it? She was there alone, had her own car. Yeah, she might have come back to town that night, but we got nothing to prove it. Or disprove it. Right. Just another one of those maybes. That's all this case is, a collection of maybes. Yeah, I see what you mean. Tell me, Sergeant... Just who was Eddie Kalin? Eddie Kalin, uh, male, Caucasian, height 5'11", weight 175, complexion olive, hair medium brown, eyes gray, age 34, birthplace now, Chicago. What was he? What did he do? He called himself a promoter. Done a lot of things. 
Small-time agent for a while, handled a few singers and dancers, vaudeville and nightclubs. Been a bookie off and on, but mainly he was a gambler. Oh, and there's another maybe for you. Now, how's that? According to rumor, that he was in an all-day poker game. It broke up only a few hours before we found the car. The game was supposedly run by a big-time gambler named Topo Leanley. And the word has it that Eddie cleaned up something over $60,000. And there was no money found on the body? Nope. Have you talked to this uh, Topo? Sternly. We had him in here for four hours this morning. He never heard of Eddie Kalin. Wouldn't know a poker deck if he saw one. Spends all his spare time raising petunias and driving his dear old mother to church. <laughs> like that, huh? <laughs> like that. So there's another one for you. Maybe Top Polo didn't like the idea of losing 60 grand, decided to get it back. Or maybe the widow wanted the insurance, or it could be that somebody else took a crack at him. And it's possible, of course, that Eddie mailed the 60000 to a blonde in Milwaukee and just ran off the road by accident. Yeah, it's possible. But I don't think so. I don't think it was an accident. I'm always getting cases like this. It's the kind they always put me on. Officially, it's because I'm a college man and majored in criminology, but... Actually, it's because I'm a Latin, Mexican ancestry, and they know I get certain feelings about a case. Hunches. Oh. And how do you feel about this one? It's hokey. Real hokey. And it's murder, not an accident. But beyond that, Ken Savi. Why don't you poke into it a little, see what you can find. Then maybe we can talk it out some more over a bottle of Muscatel. Yeah, good idea. Uh, where can I find Mrs. Kalen? Oh, the widow? Well, that's a good starting point. She's out at their apartment. There's the address. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, just one other thing, Sergeant Reynosa. When you gained access to the apartment, I assume the door was locked. Uh, yeah, it took a little effort. Oh, what kind of a lock? Uh, automatic uh, night latch? A spring cylinder? No, it was an old-fashioned warden bolt. Had to be locked with a key. Mm-hmm. What are you getting at, Mr. Dollar? Oh, a hunch of my own, Sergeant, uh... Let's save it for the Muscatel. See you later. Expense account item four, two dollars. Taxi to the Kalen apartment in West Hollywood. It was shortly after dusk by now, and the lights were coming on all over the city. It was a cool, clear night. Los Angeles at its best. As we swung off the Sunset Strip and started climbing up into the hills, I looked back across the basin toward the dark mass of the Palos Verdes headland that bounded the far side of the great carpet of lights. Three nights ago, a man had died over there in the darkness. And in a few minutes now, I'd be talking to his widow. Or at least to the woman who claimed to be his widow. Keep the change. The Argus Terrace apartments, like most of them in that section, sprawled up the hillside above the street. Six or eight apartments on as many different levels, all opening onto a central patio filled with walks, steps, and banks of tropical plantings. The Kalin's apartment was at the top, and I was still 50 feet from it when the door opened and a man came out and hurried toward me. I stepped back against the shrubbery and waited for him. Good evening, Mr. Welch. Oh. Oh. My. Oh, it's you. Your second visit to Mrs. Kalin? Second? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. I imagine you've been notified, too. Notified? Well, yes. I got a wire from the home office in Hartford this evening. That's why I'm here. Well, Mrs. Kalin has filed under the double indemnity clause of the policy. A claim for $10,000. She has, huh? She, she hopes it can be paid immediately and without any trouble. Well, I don't like to dash a lady's hopes, Mr. Welch, but I've got news for the widow. News? The claim won't be paid immediately. And before this is over, there's going to be a lot of trouble. Oh? In fact, Mr. Welsh, if my hunch is right, this claim is not going to be paid at all. Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Kalin. I think Mr. Welch told you I'd be around to see you. Oh, yes. You're the special investigator the insurance company sent out. That's right. Mind if I come in? All right, Mr. Dollar. Thanks. And through here. Your company didn't waste any time, did they? Sending you out here, I mean. No. No more than you did in filing your claim. I have a right to it. 
With Eddie gone now, I, I need the money. I see. Sit down. Thanks. How many keys are there to that door? Keys? What do you mean? Your front door. How many keys do you have? Just one. And of course, Eddie had one. Why? What difference does it make? Just about enough difference to hang somebody. Cigarette, Mrs. Kalen. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Los Angeles, to the Home Office, Trinity Mutual Insurance Company Limited, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Kalen matter. Expense account continued. That's quite a dramatic statement, Mr. Dollar. Are you prepared to name that somebody who may get hanged? Not at the moment. Could it be that you don't have a name? Mm, that's possible, of course. That you're just fishing, so to speak? Bluffing? Now, why would I do that with you? I don't know, frankly, but you must have come here for some reason. Yes, I wanted to ask you a few questions. And you'd be smart to answer them under the circumstances. What circumstances? The only one I know anything about is the tragic one of losing my husband only three days ago. You have my sympathy, Mrs. Kalen. Sergeant Renosa questioned me for hours. There's nothing more to answer. Will you go now, please? All right, if you say so. Your unwillingness to cooperate will undoubtedly prejudice your claim for the insurance. That's all you care about, isn't it? Finding some excuse for not paying off the policy. Now, wait a minute, Mrs. Kalen. I'm not crooked and neither is the company. If a claim is legitimate, they pay it, always. I'm sick of being under suspicion, of being accused. I'm not accusing you of anything. All I'm after is some information. And if you refuse to give it... Good night, Mrs. Kalen. No, wait. Wait, Mr. Dollar. Yes? Don't go. Come back, please. I'm sorry. I've been under such a strain on edge. Forgive me. That's all right. Forget it. I didn't mean what I said, but I've answered so many questions. And to go through all of it again, well, it seems so pointless. Yes, I understand but I've found that people say things to me sometimes that they forget to say to the police. They're uh, more relaxed, I guess. Don't feel they're on the spot so much. That's true. But I thought it was just me. Oh, no, you're not alone. I remembered something like that after I talked to Sergeant Renosa. He wanted to know where Eddie hung out, mostly. Bars and so on. I could only think of two. What are the names of the bars, Mrs. Keelan? Uh, the, uh, the Eloines on Beverly Boulevard and the... Brass Monkey Inn down on the Strip. What difference does it make? Eddie wasn't killed in the bar. No, but he probably met people there, talked to them. You see, it's a matter now of trying to reconstruct his life step by step, right up to the moment he died. You'd be surprised how much bartenders see and hear. And remember. I suppose they do. All right, Mr. Dollar. I'll be glad to answer any questions you want to ask. Good. One thing, though. I wasn't expecting visitors, of course, and I wonder if I could have just five minutes to change and freshen up a little. Oh, well, that's unnecessary. I won't be here long. But I'd feel better, really. Do you mind? No, no, of course not. Go ahead. I'll be right back. Pour yourself a drink, Johnny. I had the drink and waited and got ready to brace myself. <laughs> I've been through this before. Attack plan number two, a common garden variety. When you can't beat them, join them. And when the joiner is a lovely woman, the maneuver usually starts with some paraphrase of, uh, slip into something more comfortable. Why don't you have a drink? And a sudden switch to first names. And it always ends up with you and I against the world. And, uh, couldn't you forget just one little mistake? The little mistake being something like arsenic in a husband's coffee. Yeah, an old familiar pattern. And a first resort just as often as a last. She was gone 20 minutes, not five, but it was time well spent. A carefully casual touch with the hair. Makeup skillfully softened. Perfume. And one of those frothy nylon jobs designed for that special evening in. Bugle call... Charge. Like another drink, Johnny. Uh, thanks. Uh, I still have some. I think I could use one. Would you mind? Sure. What do you have? Scotch and soda, please. 
Thanks for being so patient. I feel better now. More, uh, comfortable, huh? Something like that. Easy on the soda. Right. There you are, Mrs. Keelan. Thanks. Would you do something else for me? Oh, I'd be happy to. But I don't know your first name. Touche. All right. What are your questions? How do you think it happened? I don't know. Not some enemy, because Eddie didn't have any. Just friends. Too many friends. Who are some of them? There's only one who really fits the definition, who, who's really lasted. His name is Pete Steimer. Pete Steimer? Where can I find him? You can't. Or at least the police haven't been able to. Nobody's seen him since that night. He's had nightclubs off and on, and in between he makes books. What about those other friends, the ones who don't last? <laughs> They drift in, drift out, depending mostly on whether Eddie had any money at the moment. Of course, there were women. Oh. Showgirls, mostly dancers, strippers, so on. Know any of them? Hardly. Ever hear any of their names? Always made a point not to. Otherwise, I'd have killed him long ago. Did you kill him, Mrs. Keelan? No. Did you love him? That's a good question. I think I'll have to pass it, though. I don't really know. I feel all hollow, smashed up inside over what happened. And yet there were times I'd have killed him myself if I'd had a gun. But there were other times, too, when it was so crazy sweet you wanted to die. Because you knew it'd never be like that again. Now, that's the way it was with Eddie. Mad, mixed up. Like watching a ten-ring circus from the front seat in a roller coaster. That's why women flocked around him. That's why they always ran from him later. You didn't run. Could I have another drink? Oh, sure. Were you trying to run when you went up to Arrowhead by yourself? Maybe. We had a fight. I ran out and told him I wasn't coming back. And only three days later, over the radio, I heard where he'd been found dead. Burned up in his car. Here you go. I guess they call it shock. I still can't really believe it, even though I know it's true. Well, I guess you should know. I understand you're the one who identified the body. I identified a wallet. Burned black. A wristwatch, a ring. All of them things I'd bought for him. They told me there wasn't anything that could be called a body. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, Mrs. Kalen. I know this is painful it's for you. It's all right. Like I said, I, I can't believe it. Not really. Do you have any other reason for not believing Eddie is really dead? I mean, besides just a feeling. No. No, of course not. What do you mean? What do you mean? Well, it was just a question, that's all. Forget it. But I... Let's shouldn't. get back for a moment to another question. You said you were sure it wasn't some personal enemy who killed your husband. Then what do you think? Well, the same as the police, I guess. They said Eddie won a lot of money that night from some gambler named Topo Leanley. You don't know this Topo Leanley, huh? No, but I suppose that's why Eddie was killed. The money wasn't found, so I guess it was robbery. Did you know about the money? Well, it all happened while I was up at Arrowhead, anyway... If Eddie ever had any money, I'd be the last one to know about it. He always spent his money where it would show. Where he'd get something for it. Laughs, bells, whistles, balloons going up. Not at home. Never. Yeah, I'm well, sorry. Uh... Forget I said that. I hate women who sit around drooling with self-pity. Like you said. I didn't run. I guess maybe I did love him, Mr. Dollar. Is there anything else you... No, no, I guess not. At least not tonight. You look a little beat. Yes, I'm afraid I am. You go around trying to keep up a front, but it's been rough. Yeah, I imagine. Well... That business a while ago, fixing myself up a little. This robe. I just had to do it. There are times when a woman has to feel like a woman. In order to feel anything... Even sane. 
I guess you wouldn't understand, though. And I'm afraid I gave the wrong impression. No. I think I do understand. Now. And I also think I owe you an apology. For what? For walking in here with a preconceived opinion. For being rude. Being wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgiven. Forgotten. And... Come back again, please. Regardless. I might. On one condition. Yes? Your first name. Would you mind? <laughs> it's Lila. Thanks, Lila. Good night. Good night. I caught a flash of movement from the corner of my eye and whirled around just in time to see somebody slip off the corner of the terrace and edge into the shadows of the shrubbery. I stepped off the porch and moved toward the dark hedge of banana and scrub palm. I was watching for a sudden attack, but nothing happened. Then I heard a slight sound on the next terrace level up the slope, a rustle of bushes, an accidental scrape of a shoe on the cement walk, and I slipped along the walk. I stopped at the head of the steps and listened. Nothing. The only way out of the patio to reach the street was to come past me. I started searching. But even though I was on guard when the attack came, it caught me off balance. All I could see was a dark shape and the glint of metal in an upraised fist. I grabbed the arm and twisted and drove my left into his stomach and again... He rolled to his knees and raised his right hand, and again I saw the glint of metal. I jumped for him, grabbed his hand, twisted it back, and at the same time I swung my foot and kicked him in the jaw. Johnny! Johnny, are you all right? Yeah, I'm all right. Call Sergeant Reynoso, would you, Lila? He was out cold. I turned him over on his back and struck a match to get a look at him. He was a big man, stocky, bull-necked, blonde-haired. I slid my hand inside his coat and fished out his wallet and opened it. His name was Topo Leanley. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, we meet a Latin doll from Santa Monica, an erudite bartender, and a Terpsichorean ecticiast. And they're all in the cast. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, this is an episode that shows the sort of two-edged sword of Johnny's experience. He kind of knows patterns and is able to recognize them, but sometimes can jump to conclusions that things apply universally. And I think that that's behind the change of tone with Mrs. Kalen. I don't think he's ruled her out 
as a suspect at this point in the investigation, but for now, he's giving her the benefit of the doubt. These first two episodes are a lot about gathering information and setting the stage, but with just enough action to keep it interesting, including the very sudden encounter with Topo Leanly, to wrap up episode two. And I think that that also kind of serves to set the stage for bringing Leanly more into the story, particularly as he may have a major role to play. Although I will say I don't remember precisely how this one turns out yet. So I'll be eager to see where this goes from here. Well, now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we start on YouTube where Ron Surratt, regarding the Amy Bradshaw manner, I've always wanted to order the inflatable animals, but I guess the offer has expired. Also, I've always wondered if the offer was real or a giant scam. This is a good question. In terms of whether it's a scam, I would lean towards it being real, at least in terms of them shipping out some product running nationwide ads on CBS radio, even with the decline in advertising rates, would require a lot of capital and probably more than a fly-by-night organization would possess. Whether folks got something that was really worth it, I don't know, particularly at that rate, what you may have bought may have been a, a bit disappointing. Now, I did do some research online to see if I could find any used set or unopened set, and I could not. Uh, But I think that from the description, it sounds less like something that a toy collector would seek out and more like something that would go to the goodwill without a second thought. Plus, the inflatable element would also make it likely for parts of the set to get damaged. So, if there are any toy collectors in the audience who have had it or somehow encountered it, I'd like to know, but I've not found one myself. And I do wonder what the quality of it was. Then we have a comment from Gino, who writes, The description area is a good place to put all of the show deals. I listen to a lot of old-time radio, and most of the good channels take the time to edit out all of the outdated commercials, especially the Rexall and cigarette commercials that we have heard a thousand times before. I will admit, I've never heard the huge animals commercial and found it funny, but you get the idea. I like to like, share, and subscribe to channels that take the time to make the experience better. Also, you will admit that uh, some of the Johnny Dollar outros are really long. They run out of material and you get two or three minutes of theme songs. Just uh, suggestions, respectfully, Jim. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Appreciate the suggestion. Now, I have looked at some old-time radio programs on... Uh, YouTube, and to be honest, I've not uh, heard many that actually go ahead and edit out commercials. Maybe I don't get to the best YouTube channels, uh, but most seem to just kind of post them verbatim. And I mostly do leave in commercials. There are some that I cut, but most I end up leaving in because I find them interesting, and a lot of listeners say they do a good job of capturing uh, the era and the feeling of what that was like. Now, with these multi-part Johnny Dollar episodes, there are some choices if you're going to do more than run a single part at a time. And we do cut some parts of the program file. Mostly it comes down to music, which involves cutting uh, the opening scene from middle episodes and cutting from the closing music for episodes that aren't the final episode in a podcast. So we only hear the closing music on episodes two and five. I have heard other uh, websites 
I don't know if podcasts, but other people who have uh, combined episodes have cut even more. And my personal opinion, personal feeling, no judgment on them. Uh, certainly, I can understand the philosophy of the approach, but to me, it kind of seems choppy. And again, it's a decision. And some might prefer that because it's a bit quicker. When it comes to the closing theme, while it can go on for a while, I'm not inclined to cut it because that was part of the original listening experience. And, you know, I'm fine with cutting, you know, from the middle episode so we can get into next episode. I mean, there's no reason to listen to... Uh, two minutes of theme music between episodes one and two. But when you get to the end, I don't see a reason for Rush. I I think certainly with modern day programming, the amount of time for credits has been shortened. And I think that on network television, it was to add more ad space. They didn't do it so they could add plot. They did it so they could keep kind of approximately the same amount of plot but sell more advertising and then it kind of got into a bunch of the streaming services as like a hey hey come on let's go ahead binge the next episode binge 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 but to me with older programs uh, it's just not something I go for in fact I get a little annoyed I know it's probably not rationally annoyed when I'm watching the Rockford files and I get an offer from the streaming service to end the credits and skip to the next episode of the Rockford Files and skip the opening credits. You do not skip the opening credits of the Rockford Files as far as I'm concerned. That'd be like skipping the opening of the A-Team. So that's kind of my feeling on that. I, I do care about listener experience, but if listeners would rather not listen to so much music at the end, they can do several things. They can stop, if, you know, if they don't want to hear the commentary. Or they can hit the skip 15 button on their player to go ahead to the point where I get into the commentary. Or they can speed it up and have the music go by quickly, as well as getting a few seconds of me talking like Alvin from Alvin and the Chipmunks. But if I were to cut the theme music short, it would kind of leave people with no choice but to be rushed through the theme music. I don't find that enjoyable as a listener, and I wouldn't go with that option, but you raise some interesting points, and kind of glad to explain why we uh, edit things the way we do here. And then we have a comment from Eric over on Facebook, and Eric writes regarding the Broderick matter. I think hands down the best Johnny Dollar story. Maybe it was based on two other episodes, but the way the writer slash adapter combined them was magic. Broderick's fear of being left is what caused her to leave everyone. The check writing was part of her just giving up and deciding she must be a bad person because she did such bad things, so she was going to do that. However, she's generally a good person, and she didn't have it in her. Her inability to live with herself is what drove her over the edge. It was very well done. I think that's kind of a muddled explanation, but I think I got my point across, I would agree. This serial, oddly, is the one where I decided to drop out of Johnny Dollar on the last run. In hindsight, it's odd that I chose such a great episode to do so on. Looking forward to what comes next. Well, thanks so much, Eric, and I'm glad you're going on. And I relate, because I have had times in my life where I've done things, and I've come back, you know, months or years later... And it's not that I don't think I did what I did, and I remember doing it, but I'm like, okay, why? This doesn't make any sense to me at the present. And I've talked about how we change over time, and I guess that's part of it. Finally, we have a voicemail. Uh, Let's go ahead and take a listen to this from Jonathan. Hi, Adam. Just found this phone number on a 2014 uh, episode of Johnny Dollar. Just uh, wanted to tell you, you're doing a great job. Love everything. This is Jonathan from Las Vegas, and uh, keep up the good work. 
Thanks so much, Jonathan. And I believe that uh, I've received a few really interesting emails from Jonathan uh, in Las Vegas. Not 100% certain it's the same Jonathan, because there are probably more than one. But uh, if so, great to put a voice to the emails. And I don't mention that as much. But yeah, you can call, leave a voicemail, uh, 208-991-4783. That's 208-991-GREAT-D, G-R-8-D. Now, it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Mr. Achilles, Patreon supporter since July of 2020, currently supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. And that will actually do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us with your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back on Friday with the conclusion of the Kalen Matter, but join us back here uh, tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... The works. I nose around inquiring about Alice Chambers. Finally... I learned that her rooming house is just around the corner. I turn the corner. Then I spot a crowd in front of the doorway with a couple of cops pushing them back. On the edge of the crowd stands a tall, skinny gent wearing a long black beard oh, and a long God. white toga. She looks she looks Excuse me, I'd like to get by. Ah, oh, my friend, you disappoint me. Huh? As I watched you approach, I thought, here is a man of character. Surely he will not stoop to this. Yet here you are, yielding to the same morbid curiosity which is the common denominator of the ignoramuses which our crass and materialistic culture spews forth upon our sidewalks in ever-increasing multitude. Look, save the lecture, Professor. Ah, I I do not remember making your acquaintance, yet you seem familiar with the title which my earnest but unfortunately too few students have bestowed upon me. Uh, Just psychic, I guess. Hey, uh, what's going on, anyway? Uh, Merely another unfortunate instance of man's inhumanity to man. Will you skip the double talk? Hey, does Alice Chambers live in this rooming house? A very profound question, my friend. What's so profound about it? A question which has occupied the minds of philosophers and theologians for centuries. Whither doth the soul take flight when the body... Soul? Body? Hey, wait a minute. What are you talking about? This Alice Chambers... What about her? It would appear that at some time during the course of the night, she was murdered. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.